Welcome back to We Chats with Brilliant People. So in this We Chat, we talked with Dr. Leslie Sherlin. He's one of the leading neuroscientists in sports psychology and this was recorded at JFK University in the lovely San Francisco Bay Area. Leslie has spent many years studying a lot of brains in his pursuit of identifying what neurological components separate elite athletes from regular people. So why is one person so naturally gifted while others have to try so much harder and then they still may fall short of the final hurdle? This has been his quest in his professional life to discover the answer to this important question. Him and his work have been featured on ESPN and CNN and his company has a major partnership with Red Bull. By having an understanding in neuroscience, in addition to sports psychology and clinical psychology, Dr. Sherlin incorporates techniques which support which psychological and physical, physiological states are important. So in this week chat, he talks about his own process or process wherever you come from for performance and how he uses certain techniques like reflection and introspection to evaluate his own work and performance. So it's uh, pretty enlightening about how he does that. So listen in to how this and more have helped Dr. Shailen's path in looking for the unknown in various great and brilliant minds. Enjoy this wee chat. Welcome to We Chats with Brilliant People, hosted by Dr. Allison Rodius, Professor of Sports Psychology at John F. Kennedy University. In each episode, Allison talks to highly successful people in music, sport, and the boardroom. She digs into the mental training techniques that they use to ride out the waves that challenge them in work and in life. So enjoy these We Chats with Brilliant People. Hi everyone, welcome back to We Chats with Brilliant People. Today I am with Dr. Leslie Sherlin. Welcome to We Chats. Thank you. We are having a cup of tea. Uh, British people will be delighted to know that we're drinking PG Tips and we have no money from PG Tips for giving you that information. Um, but I am excited to talk to Leslie today because um, he has really made an impact on me in the way that I think about the brain and the way I think about behavior and we have him here actually at JFK today he's talking to our students about neurofeedback and biofeedback this is my office at JFK University and so I'm excited we're talking today Dr. Sherlin is a neuroscientist and also the chief science officer of a company called Sense Labs so welcome. I'm Thank gonna you. put my tea down, but feel free to. Uh, ah. Oh, it's good stuff. Brits and tea. It's a. <laughs> so I wanted to start with this book. So some of you may know the book called The Rise of Superman, and it is authored by Stephen Kotler. 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 And neither of us have any um, are making any money from mentioning this book, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> However. Dr. Leslie Sherlin, you are in this book. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to just read out one paragraph of this book from this page. Um, so, <coughs> and the title of this is Brain Waves and Big Waves. Leslie Sherlin studies the brains of people making decisions, very, very good decisions. He's one of the world's leading experts in the neuroscience of high performance having spent his career trying to figure out what separates guys like Laird Hamilton from the rest of us. It's not just talent and training, says, says Sherlin. It's something else. And what, whatever that something else is, I sure don't have it. So, what I'm interested though is because you're here, you're already on the list of brilliant people, what is it that you do on a daily basis, uh, you know, you have started a company, a very successful company. You're a very successful scientist. What do you do to train your brain and to make yourself be able to perform at a high level? 
Well, that's a very big question. Oh, no. Actually, <laughs> there's, <laughs> that's a lot, there's, a, questions. there's a lot there. <laughs> um, so, what do I do to be able to? What? How do I train myself right. to perform at right. some level? And and really, for me, it's about a constant introspection and reflection about. Uh, how do, uh, does my body perform, how does my brain perform, mm -hmm. and what did I do, uh, what went into it, did that match what I wanted to get out, and then how do we tweak that or manage that in some other way. Specifically about what is our experience, the way we think and feel, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> does it match our environment, did we, did we have the output that we wanted in that moment. Mm. So. What's well, interesting that you, I believe you have a background in clinical psychology as mm -hmm. well, right. and you're ASP certified for right. those in sports psychology. You know that's the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, and um, I'm interested actually in how <coughs> you put all those together. You know the neuroscience, the clinical psychology, and I think you just captured it. There's a lot in what you just said, though. Mm -hmm. How do you go about do that? What what kind of tools do you use for yourself? So, for example, you say you reflect. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? So, there's a, a bit of a dissection about thought processes and emotional content. I think that kind of gets at the essence of psychology in general, but also applied to performance in sport. Um, when we are in a particular scenario, are are we being controlled by our environment, or are we influencing, or are we exerting onto our our environment and, mm -hmm. and that experience? So there's the just the expression of unpacking that, whether that's through conversation or through a thoughtful process or not. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the way our body reacts to that mm -hmm. experience and getting in the loop. There's a there's a loop between the way that we perceive information, our body and brain respond to that information, and then that causes something to happen. And then we interpret that information and we respond in a physical way. And so right. if we can, that always doesn't always go the way we want, even though rationally we're thinking it through in a particular yeah. way, it doesn't happen what we, the way we uh, choose. And I like to focus on teaching the body to interpret that information differently, or to at least the individual to be able to say, you know, that's not the response I want for this moment. It's a big deal, but I'm overreacting. I need to calm down and, and give them something tangible to do. Because lots of times that's in fact what happens, particularly with athletes, is we want to do something. Yeah. And in that moment, what do I do? I don't want to think more. That's right. not the answer. I need to do something. Okay, I'm going to control myself. Okay. So you talk about <coughs> the athletes and individuals and they. What do you do? <laughs> um, breathing. Is, a, is the first step. That's good. Yeah. Excellent. I'm glad you're doing it now. <laughs> exactly. Um, so not only does it keep us aware, but that's such an easy thing for us to become mindful of. And, we, yeah. and I use that term mindful on purpose right. because there's a much a, a increased awareness around mindfulness techniques and meditation. And there's a, a growing cultural trend towards looking inward in some way. And the breath is something that's both easy to identify and something that's easy to regulate and then all of our other systems are largely connected to it brain our hearts all those types of things so it's something very easy to that's the one that I focus on just breathe and so you tell yourself to breathe so I guess you there's almost like a pause you're telling yourself okay I need to what slow down it might be slow down it might be just do something different just be aware okay it might just focus on my breathing giving me the opportunity to stop thinking about the other things right. or specifically to gain some control. There's few things in our environment that we can control. That is one of them. Right. Not only do we have a physiological response in a positive direction, uh, decreasing the, the uh, stress response and the fight or flight mechanisms, all those types of things, but it also gives us a confidence, a control of, wow, there is something I can control. Mm -hmm. And when we take that moment, when we feel relief, we that's our natural thing. And as soon as we feel better, we go, that just feels good. If mm -hmm. you do it for a moment, just, oh, in fact, I feel better now. <laughs> um, yeah, that's good. Um, I definitely use that for myself on a regular basis, <coughs> um, and you do have to remind yourself to mm -hmm. do it. When you do it, is it a particular um, amount of time that you would do it for so many seconds, or have you got yourself into a place where you only have to do one? It depends on the the amount of pressure that we start to experience or that I start to experience. Um, if it's just in a moment like this where it's very casual and comfortable, yeah. I might over just a say, cup of tea? Over There's a cup no of tea, stress. it should no be stress-free. Uh, stress yeah. But if I, you ask me a hard question, I need to 
and think about it. Mm -hmm. Or, but if it's something, it's a big event. There's a large audience, or right. it's a it's a big moment. Then it might be something that requires more time. Mm -hmm. Generally, just being aware and going to that that concrete place mm -hmm. of I can control this is, is often enough. But focusing on on doing it for several breath cycles can be helpful. Cool. I'm always fascinated as well <coughs> that people who have um, they've developed a particular skill through uh, and knowledge through their education um, a lot of the time and then they go into business and then they're very successful at doing that how have you married the two you've got your you know your strong academic background you have a doctorate not everybody can make that leap into business and then do well at it how has that been for you um, I think I've been lucky there's a, a huge component of luck to it, and we attribute it to luck, but really there's, there's, there's no such thing as a, just getting the right moment. It was a lot of perseverance mm -hmm. and a lot of those same things that make us successful in an academic world, but then a little bit of risk, ability to... Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think business largely is about being comfortable with some amount of risk and not mm -hmm. being afraid to fail. When we talk, that's where it uh, interestingly strongly correlates with some of our athlete populations is if you can't if you're afraid to fail, you'll never compete. And it's the same in business applications. Mm -hmm. if, if I just wanted to secure eight to five, then I'm never, I might be successful in that, that thing. And for many people, that's quite enough. But if you want to really grow and stretch yourself, you have to take on a challenge if, and, and not be afraid to fail. Hmm. That's interesting. So do you, know, do you know where your line is of risk or have you, uh, have you pushed it? Have you gone to your line, or I do it every day? <laughs> every it's day. interesting, and you know, in yeah. every endeavor, it's um, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's like, is it starting my own business? Is it yeah. venturing out into a private practice, or is it making a startup? And for me, it's I, I feel very uncomfortable sometimes, and then I take that moment, and I'm like, okay, if I get through this, I'm not going to do this again. This is not comfortable. This mm -hmm. is not comfortable, and then it passes, and it either works out or it doesn't. But I'm not satisfied with with that being the end of it. Uh -huh. It's like, well, now what can I do? So it's that same, let me stretch. If I'm not doing something today that's more challenging than what I did yesterday, then I'm not growing. And I've learned, for me anyway, if I'm in a comfortable s situation, I'm not growing. I'm okay. only growing when I'm putting myself in an uncomfortable situation and figuring out what to do about it. So uncomfortable to you, <coughs> um, does that mean physical, mental, emotional, all the above? Yes everything. <coughs> so, so and, you know, obviously in the physical domain it's going to be much more uh, around you know, uh, trying to achieve something, trying to, to try out and um, trying to achieve a Boston Marathon qualifier. Well, that's obviously very different than my uh, emotional kind mm -hmm. of fear or pushing myself in a, in a business scenario of what's my risk level of both protecting you know, my career but mm -hmm. at the same time really pushing the edge. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't mm -hmm. it, how they all fit together. Right. Well, have you ever felt fear in a physical way? Uh, yeah, I'm a pilot. I fly. Oh, so, uh, yes, you're a pilot. So that's, in fact, um, I find satisfaction from running at my fears rather than running away from them. So if I am afraid of something, yeah. I want to conquer it. I want to control it and learn about it. And I, I didn't have a fear of flying, but it's probably the thing that I do that's most vulnerable. Yeah. I'm at the mercy of something else. Right. But I find that excites me in such a way of being prepared. Huh. That's Making sure that I'm at my best. Let's just touch a little bit. We're, we're, we're close to in the last sure. few minutes, but let's just touch a little bit on that pilot stuff. Okay. Because that's, <coughs> to me, that's high risk. Mm -hmm. and to pilots it may not be or they know the risk and then still do it anyway I loved that you said you run I think you run towards your risks as mm -hmm. opposed to run away from them or you mm -hmm. know um, is there anything else around that as particularly as a pilot that you can you can uh, say in a, in a tangible way like wh what does that mean to you 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 assess the risks on the morning of or just in general as a, as a pilot I think you're always, you know, there's a certain level of risk that then becomes not smart. 
and you know, right. deciding that the conditions aren't conducive for any particular person to fly or your particular skill level is, is not running into your fear, it's yeah. running into stupidity. So we want to be cautious about right. knowing our, what the real limits are, but if it's something that if I know my skill can achieve this particular outcome and I decide not to do it just because I'm afraid, then I'm going to beat myself up over that. So yeah. if if another individual, the way I think about it is, if another individual with the same skill, yeah. the same ability as I have, are safe to do that thing today, yeah. then I should do it. I like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You re you really you really do put yourself out there then. I try. In more way, um, more ways than one. I try. I thought it was really interesting when you said you really your you're taking the risks when you're, you, you and you're put, you're growing when mm -hmm. you are uncomfortable. Right. And I think a lot of people, I mean, by definition, uncomfortable doesn't feel good. Right. So we try to avoid it, mm -hmm. and it's hard to be in that uncomfortableness. That's right. And it's, but if we can embrace that uncomfortableness when we come through the other side again, there's a difference right. in being not smart and being uncomfortable. So I'm not promoting doing things that are <laughs> too risky. Right. But you know, assuming your skill and your, your ability can match the uncomfortableness, then go do it. You don't know what you'll achieve right. if you don't. And, and when you come out the other side, that feeling, that ability to to have conquered that moment is pretty profound. Yeah. And I, c I think it can come down to everyday <coughs> life too. You know, there are many times in our lives that we will, we're not necessarily doing a high risk venture and we feel uncomfortable. Sure. So you can still embrace it and not necessarily work through it or ignore it, but you can embrace it and say, right. okay, and it'll pass. Exactly. I we do this in our relationships, with yeah. our children, with our significant others, yeah. all sorts of opportunities for us to put ourselves out there and, and learn how to if nothing else, manage it so when we encounter it the next time we go, I've been here before. Right. It's I've okay. grown. I, I've grown, I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And Love that it. Is growth. Love it. Okay. Well, we better um, go on to the next little seg okay. segment. Is that okay? Yeah. So I'm going to ask you um, to make a choice in a, co in a couple of different uh, okay. things. Okay. They're really easy. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> uh, chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Okay. Um... Mountain or ocean? Ocean, always. Oh, okay. Um, music or sport? Ooh. Ooh. <sighs> um, I'm, I'm, for me, I'm going to choose music. Okay. And dog or cat? Dogs. <laughs> no question. <laughs> <laughs> and the last one isn't a choice, but it's just an interest I have. Do you, can you speak another language other than uh, yeah. fine? American English? <laughs> Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I desire very much and I like to hack around at something that no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you should learn the Hawaiian. Oh, then you can yes. Yeah. That would be fantastic. There you go, because I know right. you love Hawaii. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, it's been fantastic having oh, a wee you. chat with you today. Thank you so much for thank being you. a part of the Brilliant People list. Tune in next time to see who we're talking to next time on Wee Chats with Brilliant, Brilliant People. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed these Wee Chats. You can follow Wee Chats with Brilliant People on Twitter at Wee Chats and Facebook. And subscribe to the podcast series on iTunes or any Droid platform. Wee Chats with Brilliant People.